I'm not even going to tell you how much the body damage costs. It's really horrible. <laughs> I mean, I, it was like basically, I all, it was like just under what it would cost to just buy the car. <laughs> so that was also really cool. Um, and then uh, when, we were at the, when we were at the birthday party, <clears throat> we were on the corner and, and Mason Muse. Why don't, um, why don't things have birthdays? Like, why don't mom's glasses have birthday? <laughs> or, why doesn't our house have a birthday? Or, why don't dad's underwear have a birthday? <laughs> and then Wes said, Can butts sweat? <laughs> Uh, how did we get there? <laughs> anyway, enough about me. Let's talk about you. Do you have any questions? Hi, I'm Hi. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, like, after being Cassiel for a whole day, is it kind of weird to switch back into being yourself? Like, because you're so different from him? Are you having trouble? <laughs> Are you having trouble relating to people as, as you, when you're dressed as Cass? Yeah. Are you worried about going back to regular life? Yeah. Or whether, do you think it might cause permanent damage? It, it could be multiple personality disorder, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think ultimately with Cass, I think, I think more the, the character infection happened in the other direction. Cass started really, really strong and powerful, and then he became sort of nerdy and socially awkward over time, and I think that that's because my real personality imbued the character over time. Um, I, uh, I did play this uh, character in, I played a real-life serial killer in a terrible made-for-TV movie. Um, I, while I was playing that character, I was really making an effort to get into the head of this serial killer. And there were like audio tapes that I could listen to of him, and lots and lots of press and material that I could, you know, process. And I started dreaming his dreams. Oh. And it scared me to death. I was like, oh my god. Did I just turn myself into a serial killer? <laughs> um, luckily, when we stopped production, that, like, the vast majority of that went away. <laughs> um, but in general, I, I think it's easy to take off the, the cast uh, trench coat and, and put, put it in the closet and, and, and leave it there until I come back next time. Yep. Hi. Hi, Misha. How are you? I'm good, thanks for asking. Okay, I have a question. So, besides... Oh, speak, I'm sorry, I, 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 sidebar, I just remembered something that was funny happened earlier. <laughs> So, uh, I was in the VIP meet greet, and sitting there, there were uh, a bunch of creation people behind me, and, uh, and then we finished the meet and greet, and I uh, looked at my phone, and there was a text from Victoria, who's my handler, and uh, it said, pull up pants. <laughs> Apparently, I have been plumbers cracking. <laughs> Sorry, that was definitely not related to what we were talking about. But I, I have to tell you. <laughs> Besides the most recent episode, because don't want links for spoilers on the episode that aired this week, but okay. what is your favorite episode from season 14 besides the most recent one and why? Hmm. Well, I think probably, I think probably the 300th was my favorite. I, I, I liked, I liked a, a couple of different things about that episode. I liked um, visiting the, the town and exploring that thing that I think everybody who's watched the show over time has wondered about, like, how about these guys? They do go by grocery, like what happened? 
you know, I mean, eventually we should also just have like a spring cleaning episode. Like, <laughs> Wait a minute, who does laundry and who does the dishes and, you know, uh, it's cats. Uh, uh, while, while everyone else is sleeping, he's uh, busily folding laundry. Um, dusting. He has this cute little number that he wears. Um, so, um, but yeah, I liked that. And then, of course, it was, you know, lovely to have Jeffrey Dean back, um, you know, I wish we could have more of him, but that was, that was just cool. So, yeah, how about you? Definitely same. Oh, okay. Great. You didn't have to agree with me, but that's, <laughs> but I appreciate it. It's emotional and beautiful, so that's why. It was emotional. All right. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Hi. Hi. What's your favorite part about being part of the Always Keep Fighting and Bring Acts? Uh... Ooh, that's a big question. Um, well, uh, I guess it's been really gratifying to be able to... Um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm not even going to try to say what my favorite part is because I'm not sure, but I'll just tell you some, uh, something that I have been really appreciative about. Um, well, I'll tell you one thing right now. I'm really appreciative of um, Rachel and, and Jen and, and the whole Random Act staff who do so much work and just keep at it day after day um, and often get no thanks and uh, definitely get no money. Um, and it's just really awesome to have a team of people Care who put their effort into something. Um, I, I guess one thing that I really loved is um, kind of I've been calling it gamifying good, um, but finding ways to um, turn doing something good into something playful at the same time, so people can you know have fun and not feel like it's a chore or a slog. Um, so like integrating Gish the scavenger hunt with um, you know helping um, you know genocide survivors or um, you know saving a dance school in South Africa or something like that just feels so awesome to me. I just I, I love it. Um, And then, uh, yeah, so that's very rewarding. Another thing that's been rewarding is we've been doing these trips for many years now down to Haiti and Nicaragua, <clears throat> um, where we, um, first in Haiti we built an orphanage, and then in Nicaragua we built uh, a, a free high school. Um, and those projects are pretty big and pretty, they took a lot of time. And so groups of volunteers would come down, and there'd be from, mostly from the U.S., a few from Europe, um, but they would come down <clears throat> on the trips, like 25 people would come down with me and work on the projects. And I think a lot of people who were joining those trips, um, they had to raise money for the project in order to come on the trip. It was sort of a fundraising scheme. Um, but a lot of the people who came on those trips sort of got into it thinking they were going to do something for other people. And watching how many of those people that joined the trips were actually transformed by the experience was also really surprising and really awesome to watch. So many of the people that you know came down with me to Haiti ended up going back on their own and doing more work there. Uh, and same with Nicaragua. Some people ended up staying in Nicaragua for a year um, and uh, really like pouring themselves into it. So it was awesome to see. Really loved that. Thanks for asking. Hi. Well, there was a question in one of the older Supernatural episodes, and I was just wondering why you didn't answer it. And it's, what's a Nisha? What is a Nisha? So in the French mistake, what happened? Somebody said, what is a, oh, so, oh, oh, it was probably Sam or Dean. They came in and they were like, what is a Nisha? Yeah. Great question. <laughs>
<laughs> one that I don't think has been answered yet. I am struggling to find the answer to that myself. I forgot that line, it's really funny. That was such a great episode. Um, we talked about my favorite, favorite episode of this past season, but that, that's still probably my favorite episode of the entire series. Just so great. And what a lot of people don't know is that there were all of these little hidden, there were layers to that episode. There was a layer, there was like just, you know, you could break, watch it as some, a casual viewer and still think, oh my god, this is so weird how they break the fourth ball. You could watch it um, <clears throat> as a super fan and pick up details, you know, of what was being talked about. But then there were lots of jokes in there that were just for the crew. Like, just for people who had been on the set and knew um, one another and one another's you know, idiosyncrasies. Um, and that was just so satisfying. Um, and, you know, like the whole thing of Jared having an alpaca and those giant, you know, portraits of himself on the wall. That's all true. That's it, I think they're... That can't be true. <laughs> oh my god, I can't believe I'm, I'm coming up blank on it. such an easy question. Um, oh yeah, that's always a good example. Yeah, my, my accident after being so smug. Um, I mean, Vicky is embarrassed by me all the time. She has this look that she does, which is just like... Um, I don't know. I, I really... I'm really struggling here. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, I... <clears throat> I know that I've, you know, had, I've had moments of, <laughs> of, um, you know, terrible embarrassment with Vicky around, or, but I think it's, you know, it's me that's embarrassed mostly. She, there, she's just <laughs> ashamed, which is different. <laughs> different. Um, <clears throat> I've told this story before, so I won't tell it in, in full, you know, detail, but there was a time when I ate too much vegetarian Chinese food and then got on a long flight. <laughs> and, um, and I, I decided to, um, I was, you know, it was a full flight and I was packed in the middle and I didn't want to, like, you know, get up and uh, you know, go to the back just to fart. And so, <laughs> I thought if I could just, you know, parse it out a little bit. <laughs> but I guess when I was the pressure in the cabin or something, I couldn't totally control the throttle. <laughs> and it all came out at once. <laughs> and the guy sitting behind me fainted. <laughs> And then the flight attendants came. They had not a, not a word of a lie. They had a, an oxygen tank. <laughs> and they gave they administered oxygen to him. And he came to and his, 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 his girlfriend said to the flight attendants, <laughs> And they said, ma'am, that's impossible. All of the fuel is stored in the wings. Anywhere near the fuse so that's impossible. And the guy sort of, you know, vibed, and then I fell asleep, and then I woke up, and I farted again, and he fainted again. And they administered oxygen again, and she whispered again, and they, they
they said it's impossible again, and the woman sitting next to him, very loudly, no, somebody has to go to the bathroom. And that was pretty, that, that was pretty embarrassing. And it, the pain didn't stop because it was a it was a coast to coast flight. When we landed in, in DC, um, everybody on the plane had to stay in their seats while paramedics took the guy off the plane against his protestations. He was like, "I'm fine, I'm fine." It was just a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and again, in that instance, Vicky was just a shame. <laughs> and there was a point where she made eye contact with me, and I knew that she knew. <laughs> Thanks, Drew. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Very kind of you to say thank you. And my question is, if you were a drag queen, what would your name be? Fucking <laughs> brilliant Leah, by the way. Uh, probably Sassiel. Fancy that, like, 
keep her safe. The bathtub, I guess we got like the most rundown trailer in the park, and the bathtub had fallen through the floor, brought it out, the bathtub had fallen through the floor. Um, and so we, when we showered, it was just like showering into a hole into the, in the ground. And, um, and she picked up this stray dog named, that she had named Fancy, who was not that fancy. <laughs> Fancy was just covered in fleas. And we could, I, mean, I guess every time Fancy would go back outside, uh, she would pick up more fleas, and then kind of so the trip was like full of fleas, and it was, it was awesome. And then I, you know, I was making fiberglass, so I was just scratching constantly. Um, but it was, a, it was a good time. Everybody, yeah, I remember everybody would go to Wally, they called it Wally World. Um, on Fridays when they got paychecks, and we would too, we'd go to you know, Walmart, and, buy something and then come home and look at it. <laughs> you know, as consumers do. Um, <clears throat> we also had the world, we had the, the world's shittiest car, the Chevy Citation, the 1980 Chevy Citation. Oh there are these little hatchbacks, but they had V8 engines. And so it was just like this incredibly bizarre thing to drive around in because it's like it was kind of like driving the Apollo. Like it had this monster engine, but it was this tiny, hideously ugly little brown car. And um, and when it would turn it off, it would keep running. <laughs> like it couldn't shut itself off for some reason uh, for like two minutes. And then once I went for a jog, I might have told the story. I went for a jog in a park and I drove to the park and then. Went for a jog and got kind of dusky and tried to drive out. The gate was closed, and I was like, "Oh no, I can't get out!" And then I noticed like there was a big oak tree between the post. It was a, it was the post of the gate, and then a big oak tree. So I was like, "I think." I kind of like put my arms out and like paced it out. I think I fit, and I <laughs> I went through, and it didn't fit. <clears throat> But it only didn't fit by about two inches. And the car was such a piece of shit that I was like, whatever. So I just squashed the car, ripped off both mirrors, and made the car a tiny bit more narrow than it was before, completely like ripping off both sides. Uh, and it really completed the picture. The car looked great after that. But that was a, yeah, it was a very, very interesting time. And muggy, so hot muggy there in the summertime. Wow, a lot of sweating. Um, <laughs> all right, thanks. Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Wonderful. Oh. So I was wondering, what has your training been like since you've been ramping down from the marathon? Wait, what? What is your training, like your running regime? What has oh, it been like since the marathon? Since the marathon? Good. <laughs> um, I kind of, kind of injured uh, one of my hips, I guess, training, um, and and so the whole training process for me was a little tough because I kept on like, you know, taking several days off to let it get better, but it wasn't quite better. And then I run again, and then I had to take several more days off, and so I was not really in shape during the marathon, um, marathon time. But then I got a really bad cold the Friday before the marathon. So bad that I was literally in bed all day on Friday. And then, you know, the morning of the marathon, I was taking lots of cold medicine because I figured that was probably the best way to get through it. And lots and lots of ibuprofen. And I, I, I think what happened is like the, the cold medicine just like dried out my joints or something. But my, I've been <clears throat> limping ever since. Like my, both my hips uh, have been bad. And I've been to like doctors and stuff, but I haven't been able to run since the marathon, unfortunately. Um, and I thought I was gonna, I was like, I'm gonna try to beat my personal best time, which had been, you know, I don't know when I last ran a marathon, 10 years ago or something. And um, which was like fast. I was like, for, I mean, for me, it was like three hours and 45 minutes, and I was an hour behind that, which didn't do much for my ego. Um, but I'm, I've been doing a lot of um, you know, Pilates and weightlifting um, and eating as my regimen since the marathon. Yeah. How about you? What's your, what's your regimen? 
Uh, I recently ran a half marathon, uh, mm -hmm. and ever since then I've just been doing three or four miles, uh, two or three days a week. That sounds so great. great. Yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> um, all right, you gonna do another one? I'm contemplating it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a scary thought. I barely made it through the half. Yeah. Okay. Do it. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Misha. Um, so my husband and I wanted to know how you went about preparing to take on the role of Lucifer, going from Castiel. Um, well, I watched what Mark Pellegrino did in, you know, I, I got the DVDs and, and went back and looked at, you know, the scenes that he had done. And then I, on the morning of the first day of shooting um, my Lucifer stuff, I went actually over, uh, Mark was in town, and I went over to his apartment and said, you know, said, can you just show me what you did? <laughs> and, uh, and talk to him about the character and, you know, his mindset. He told me <clears throat> that in every, <clears throat> me, every scene, uh, Lucifer was thinking, either I want to kill that person or I want to have sex with them, one of the two. <laughs> and, uh, and that helped frame everything for the character for me. Um, it, it was a lot, I had a lot of fun with that particular iteration of cast. Um, and it was largely part of the uh, groundwork that Mark had laid. It's just so, you know, rich. There you go. Hi. Hi. So, um, my friend is the, probably at this point, everyone knows who I'm talking about, Gum Girl. Um, so, she unfortunately wasn't picked for asking this question, but she's been trying to ask everybody at every panel, what is their favorite flavor of gum? So, I'm here in her place. So, what is your flavor? Favorite flavor of gum? Um, there's like a dentine cinnamon gum. So <laughs> that is not. This is a very different reason to like it. Um, my my father always chewed it, and he kept it like in his desk drawer and in the console of his van. And so the smell of that gum was like very reminded me reminds me of my dad, which is really weird now that I know that story. Um, wow. Uh, mm -hmm. um, there was a scene in which uh, Sam tackles Tess, and and he's on. Unfortunately, it was scripted that he's on top of me while we have a bit of dialogue. <laughs> There's one, probably 20, 25 minute long tape that went through every iteration of inappropriateness. <laughs> and at one point I remember thinking, oh my god, I hope this never makes it out into the public because we'll be ruined forever. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was a particularly memorable experience. <laughs> and that's all you're getting. <laughs>